Argentina, 1955. Juan Domingo Perón is a fallen idol. Statues of the deposed dictator are taken down and driven through the streets of Buenos Aires as the crowds curse and spit. The end of a turbulent era that begins with Juan Perón's election as president in 1946. An ardent admirer of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, Perón patterns his policies after those of Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, promising to avoid their mistakes. Hailed as El Codillo, the strongman, Perón enacts a program of sweeping social reforms, the 40-hour week, retirement at age 55, and special vacation centers for workers. realizes and shrewdly exploits the flow of political power from rural to city areas. His popularity grows as his giveaway programs expand. Perón has found a perfect helpmate, Maria Eva Duarte, a former actress whom he marries and makes Secretary of Labor. Evita Perón becomes the wife mother of the poor and working classes. The little Madonna who spends millions of dollars on homes for the aged, for indigent mothers and for working girls. A glamorous figure in expensive dresses and lavish jewelry, Evita is also a dazzling ambassador at large for Argentina and one of the most powerful women in this century. Juan Perón is riding high, carefully cultivating the programs and publicity that will strengthen his image and iron hand. A fistic reunion of Jack Dempsey and Louis Furpo offers the opportunity for El Codillo to remind ringsiders that Argentina, a vast land nearly the size of Western Europe, is the richest country in all of Latin America. Suddenly, a personal tragedy as Perón campaigns for re-election in 1951. His beloved Evita is stricken with cancer. But still, the little Madonna appears before the crowds that love and worship her to ask their support for her husband. A year later, at the age of 33, Evita Perón is dead. The funeral procession is a mile long as her casket is carried on a gun carriage through the crowded streets of Buenos Aires. Now begins a growing disenchantment with Peronista policies, his rigid censorship of the press, including seizure of La Prensa, his throttling of all political dissent. Then, in a country where more than 90% of the population is Catholic, El Codillo comes into open conflict with the church. In September 1955, all three branches of the armed forces combine to seize control of the floundering country. The decade of dictatorship is ended as crowds ransack Peronista headquarters, burning and destroying the symbols and reminders of the ousted dictator. Juan Perón is sent into exile, traveling to Paraguay, Panama, Venezuela, and the Dominican Republic before finally settling in Spain. Followers of the deposed leader are barred from holding public office as General Eduardo Lonardi is installed as the 30th president of the Argentine Republic. Perón's former home is open to the public and visitors see automobiles and clothing, furs and jewels valued at hundreds of thousands of dollars. Government auditors report that during Perón's years in power, 
Argentina's treasury has been drained of one and a quarter billion dollars. From his luxurious villa outside of Madrid, the exile leader keeps in touch with his loyalists at home through letters, taped messages, and personal envoys. Juan Perón continues to be a significant factor in Argentine politics. While the Peronistas cannot run for office, their votes are a firm electoral foundation for any candidate seeking the presidency. And so when limited constitutional government is restored in 1956, the successful candidate for president seeks and runs with Peronista support. He is Arturo Frondizi, who remains in power until 1962, when he agrees to let Peronista candidates run in local elections. The result, a stunning defeat for the Frondizi government. Military leaders act quickly to nullify the election outcome. Deeply conservative, they want no part of either Peronism on the extreme right or communism on the far left. Arturo Frondizi is made to pay for his miscalculating the power of the Peronistas. He is forced out of office and flown into exile. A new president, Jose Maria Guido, is installed and thus begins a succession of military and civilian governments that stumble and fall from power. With each new failure, the people are reminded that there is always another alternative, Juan Perón. In 1972 and 1973, economic and political conditions deteriorate dramatically. The country's rate of inflation is the third highest in the world, and in a six-month period, the cost of living skyrockets 67%. Foreign firms evacuate executives and threaten to leave Argentina entirely in the wake of kidnappings and extortions that net terrorist guerrillas $80 million. Amid the unrest, national elections are called and a former dentist, Hector Campora, running with Perón's blessings, is elected president in March 1973. Campora makes it clear that he is merely an interim executive, filling the office until arrangements can be made, plans completed for the triumphant return of Juan Perón. I am, says Hector Campora, his obedient servant. June 1973, Perón's exile is ending as Generalissimo Franco leads the farewell ceremonies at Madrid airport. Juan Perón, 78 years old and ailing physically, is returning after 18 years to a country that is more deeply divided than when he left. The intensity of the division casts a dark cloud over his return to Argentina. Rival factions within Perón's own party turn a mammoth welcoming rally into a mutual massacre. More than 100 people die, and hundreds more are injured as rightist and leftist elements rake each other with gunfire near the Buenos Aires airport. Yo ya estoy amortizado en el sentido político. The very next day, El Codillo goes on television to denounce the bloody confrontation and declare that terrorism has no place in the Peronista movement. Less than a month after Peron's return, his obedient servant, Hector Campora, resigns paving the way for new presidential elections. A 
a caretaker government is established as Campora redeems his campaign pledge. Campora to office, Peron to power. He has served just seven weeks, the shortest term in Argentine history. The stage is set for the country to turn back the clock as Peron announces his candidacy and selects his third wife, Isabel, a 42-year-old former cabaret dancer, to run for vice president. During the campaign, Isabel carries the Peronista banner for the aging Codillo. But the crowds turn out whenever and wherever Juan Peron comes to speak. The old dictator continues to preach moderation and denounce violence. He promises that he will create a socialist fatherland. And he talks of Argentina as a leader among the non-aligned nations of the third world. The past is forgotten. Juan Perón is the hope of the future. Both the masses and the military look to him as the only man who can somehow pull together a nation wracked by terror and teetering on the brink of civil war. As election day nears, the question is not whether Perón will win, but by how much. The answer, when the ballots are counted, is a resounding 62%, more than two and a half times his closest rival. Now Juan Perón must shape the future that will determine his ultimate place in Argentine history, and more crucially, the future of the country itself. The man and the country, once again their destinies and fortunes are entwined. Juan Domingo Perón has achieved a political comeback without parallel in Latin American history. But he knows better than most men how fast and how far the mighty can fall. New York State Electric and Gas has presented this edition of the Screen News Digest to build a greater understanding of the vital issues of our times.